We're going to about time to start our next panel, which is entitled Reflections and Actions. Where do we go from here? And I'm just going to introduce our moderator, uh, and, and Bob will introduce everybody else. So our moderator for this panel, Reflections and Actions, Where Do We Go From Here, is Professor Robert G. Eccles. Um, I've known Bob for a, more than a few years. I had the privilege of meeting Bob uh, when I took a doctoral course at Harvard Business School called The Role of the Corporation in Society. As an outgrowth of that, Bob and I wrote a few academic papers that are, have exciting titles like Implied Materiality and the Climate Custodians, or Materiality in Corporate Governance. I know this panel will be much more exciting than that, and Bob might even talk about something called The Statement. Um, Bob is one of the, has a very long resume, uh, founding chairman of SASB. Uh, currently, he is the chairman of Arabesque Partners, the, the world's first ESG quant fund in London and is a visiting professor at the Oxford Said School of Business. So now I'll turn the proceedings over to my good friend, Bob Eccles. Thank you, Tim. Thank you. So I'd like to begin, I'm just gonna give a very brief introduction, actually just the name and title of my panelists. And I'm gonna explain the deep logic by which they're seated in the sequence they are, which I'm sure you're going to appreciate. Uh, then I'm going to ask a question to tee it up, and I'll say what that question is in a moment. And then we're going to let her roll and see what happens. So to my immediate left is my good friend Erica Karp, who is the founder and CEO of Cornerstone Capital. To her left, my other good friend, Graham McMillan. He is the Senior Program Officer for Inclusive Economies at the Ford Foundation. To his left is my new best friend. <laughs> we met an hour or two ago, Aruma Ote, who is the Vice President and Treasurer of the World Bank. Uh, before that was head of the Nigerian SEC. She was a Director General and is an esteemed graduate of Harvard Business School, but we never had the good fortune of meeting there. And um, on the end, my good friend Mark McDivitt, who is the head of ESG solutions at State Street in their global exchange business. So here's the logic for the order. Erica, you have in your OCIO business a billion dollars, roughly, in assets under management. It's pretty good for a year. Graham, the Ford Foundation has about 12, so it's an order of magnitude difference. World Bank has about 150 billion, another order of magnitude. Mark's the big dog on the end, right? SSGA has $2.5 trillion in assets under management. But this whole afternoon is about the long term. So Erica, I've been thinking about the long term, your little startup, it's going well, but we need to think long term, Erica. So with the help of my good friend Anna Snyder back there, we ran some numbers. State Street is 225 years old, so they managed to get to 2.5 trillion <laughs> in 225 years. So I thought if you take a billion dollars <laughs> and you grow it at 10% a year and you compound that for 225 years, you have roughly 20 quintillion dollars. <laughs> Thank you. Which would make you 10 million times bigger than State Street. But they will be growing on that. So if you're willing to think long term with me, Erica, <laughs> I think we can go someplace. I wasn't, but I am now. Okay, yes. now you're going to be long term. So here's the way I'd like to start the session. I had no idea what was going to happen this afternoon. I thought it was fascinating what CECP was doing. All credit to Daryl and to Mark and to Tim. But we were going to have CEOs present long term plans. I had no idea. So what I'd like to do is ask each of my panelists, kind of given what they do, their organizations, um, kind of what they expected coming in. I need to make one more comment about you, Erica, because if you look on the schedule, you'll see that Erica's name is enlisted. There's some no good named Curtis Ravenall who you know, had some excuse about illness, and that's the second time he's blowing me off. 
and I've told him, so it's okay, you can tell him. There was a little exchange between Eric and Mark Toulet about, gee, you know, my name isn't on it. You know, Mark said, gee, I'm sorry, it was a mistake. You were very gracious. Actually, it wasn't a mistake. They did it on purpose. <laughs> Because you were from the cell side for so long, and Daryl made a big point that there was no cell side people in here. I didn't You're lucky that. to be here. So let's just kind of get that on the table right now. <laughs> now, but with that, what did you think was going to happen? I mean, you've seen presentations on the cell side for years. What did you think these long-term plans were going to look like? Well, the hope is that we were going to see, and we did, we were going to see um, commentary that, that gave insight to the values of an organization, the priorities, the mission, the purpose, um, you know, Vince is, is particularly um, articulate, I think, in talking about the purpose of BD. And so I was thinking, okay, so we'll get a sense of priorities and we'll get a sense, hopefully, of consistency because this is as in my sell side hat or in my buy side hat. What I'm looking for is companies that show serious consistency across everything that they're doing in the realm of environmental, social, and governance performance. And the consistency includes measures and metrics, and the consistency um, also includes a commitment to, um, well, Vince, you used the word relentless. So we have a definition at Cornerstone of corporate sustainability. In fact, we prefer the term corporate excellence. And the definition is as follows. It is the relentless pursuit of material progress towards a more inclusive and regenerative economy. Because what that gets to is the private sector driving progress to deal with the world's imperatives. And so when you think about that definition, a broad definition, and combine it with a corporate purpose, a corporate statement, then we can really move forward. Because the private sector leads, um, it leads the investment community and that leads the government in terms of getting stuff done. You know, and Mark talked about this before, I think. We do need to move trillions if we are going to deal with the imperatives of the day. And just to give you a sense, one of the imperatives, obviously, is climate change. Um, Curtis would tell you, if he were here, uh, that the data shows that um, in the past year, about $400 billion was invested in dealing with climate change, alternative energy. We need more like $1.3 trillion a year to move quickly towards replacing the current uh, fossil fuel-based infrastructure. And then we're just talking about climate change. Let's get to economic inclusion. Let's get to education. Let's get to healthcare. Let's get to all these giant imperatives. So we need to move trillions. So what I was hoping to hear is that corporate um, alignment, intention, and consistency around driving sustainability and the imperatives uh, that we've got in the world. And by the way, I, I wasn't disappointed. I think we saw some of that. Um, I think we need to do more. And I think, uh, well, I know, in the boardrooms of the world, we are seeing discussions now about the metrics, whether they be kind of grand metrics or, um, or micro metrics that drive performance and aligning that with incentivization, compensation, because you know we do have a messed up incentive structure if we're going to go from, to long-term thinking. So that's kind of the stuff I Great. was thinking. Thanks. Graham, what were you expecting? Well, I have full disclosure, I'm the program officer at the Ford Foundation for CCP, so don't consider this a review of the performance of the grant. Um, <laughs> How are they doing? Uh, actually, great. Um, and, and, and actually, would like to extend a, a note of thanks to our friends at Heron for um, making us aware of the Strategic Investor Initiative, because this is certainly um, the step in the necessary and right direction. Um, I have spent a lot of time with the team, and, and, and really, uh, having been formerly employed at Citigroup and been to a number of CCP meetings, when this was uh, shared with me when I joined Ford, I, I did not get it. Um, I, was, I, I was, you know, not convinced, and then um, had a chance to spend some, some time with, with Daryl and immediately got it um, because it's so much about the power of peers and influence and, and trust in a shared community, and that's what CCP has in spades. So in the sense of being influential in that regard, you know, as, as the catalyst, it was you know, compelling in that sense. What I would like to have seen today, um, so I was very much encouraged, I would, but I, I just point out three things. One is a consistency in presentation. Um, there, and, and this is the luxury of you know, working at a philanthropy. I can say this and you know, little consequences. I don't have to actually run a Fortune 50 or Fortune 500 company. 
Uh, but just the consistency of presentation of information would be quite helpful. I think there's an element of standardization. And as much as we can try to get to compare apples to apples, that would be helpful. I frankly would have liked to have seen longer term. I mean, I recognize it gets kind of ridiculous and intergalactic once you get past three to five years. But nonetheless, I didn't have a sense of the future. Uh, because when we, you know, Erica said it absolutely correctly, and, and we anchor at Ford uh, around roughly three, three and a half trillion dollars of the annual investment gap, which in some respects is a combination of the SDGs um, and, and, and an element of the Paris Agreement, the INDCs, and, and our, our colleague here from the World Bank will probably put a finer point on that number, but let's just call it a very large number. And, 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 and an ability to get to close that really requires us to look at basically global risk frameworks. And effectively, that's what the Sustainable Development Goals are, and the Paris Agreement is, 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 is a form of a, a, a risk framework for the planet. And as much as we put these sections up that say we're addressing that, I think the more that we actually talk about how the strategy and the tactics align very specifically to those frameworks, we'll go further. Because let's keep in mind, the 17 goals have, what, I don't know, 180 below them. Um, and that's when you start to get into actually the framework. So the more that we start to see numbers and KPIs of companies anchored against that, I think the more that we start to see some progress. But on day one, Daryl and team, you know, this, is, this is a game changer. It has the opportunity to really um, move forward. I think September is going to be fascinating. Um, but this is a good start. Great. What, He's what, what a tough examiner. I, I thought this was a phenomenal um, uh, sessions that we've had. I, uh, and maybe my expectations. Were I don't low. have to manage anybody's <laughs> money. That's why I can say that. <laughs> so. Maybe my expectations were lower. I came in um, expecting that I will preach to the unconverted, uh, and I kind of feel that um, you know we've had, we have a choir and we have evangelists. Uh, who are really taking this forward? I have to say that I, I, you know, I, it's our day job at the World Bank and the UN and any uh, multilateral agency to think long term, to think um, ESG. Uh, but to hear CEOs give concrete examples of how their businesses have evolved uh, in response to thinking long term, and I, I listened to the IBM presentation, and I thought. You know, people remember IBM when it was big, big, you know, they, they were selling big machines and they were dis disrupted by Apple uh, and Microsoft. And now they really, I mean, their business is like so different uh, from when it started. And it also made me think about some of the benefits um, to all of us in this room of thinking long term. Um, it is a competitive tool to think long term. It is a competitive tool to think ESG. So while I agree with you that what some of the next steps should be, should be to think about how to have common standards, a common basis, common like lingo, um, I think where we are uh, is certainly something that, that needs to be celebrated. Great, thanks, Mark. Well, Bob, I owe you a thank you note, uh, or thank you for putting me last because everything I wanted to say has already been said. Uh, but I will elaborate a bit. Um, I think it all goes back to, uh, we touched on it, 21st century globalization, automization, and one piece that really wasn't, we touched on it, we'd like to touch on it more, is big data. So when you think State Street, when one thinks State Street, we say asset manager, 2.4, 2.5 trillion dollar asset manager. That's 20% of State Street. I represent the other piece, which is the 80%. We have 28.5 trillion in custodial assets. And I bring that piece up because we have big data in-house. And what we're hearing from our asset owner client base, our asset manager client base, our endowments, all of our clients is we need consistency, very well articulated. We need consistency around the data. And this is a big shout out for SASB, the Sustainability Accounting Standards Board. That's their objective, to define materiality, look at ESG factors and what do we see as material. We're in the process of State Street, so five buckets in State Street, Global Asset Management, SSGA. I came from Global Markets. If you saw my CV, it's old. I used to trade FX. Uh, principal in FX, um, a um, uh, custody business, which is our um, uh, custody admin space called Global Services, and I sit in Global Exchange, where we do the data analytics and research piece. And so what we're working on there is looking at that research. So long-winded way to say I would like to focus more on the data piece and getting consistency um, around defining materiality across all the CEOs we talked to today. So let me ask you a question about data. So. Um, when you, when you talk to asset owners in particular, my informal sense is that there's more awareness about the sustainable development goals than the corporate community. That would be different in Europe. 
Vincent talked about, you know, the SDGs. Um, there's 169 different business indicators that go along with these 17 SDGs. And if we were thinking about it, you know, we talked about, you know, standardization, you were talking about the importance of the private sector. Um, would it be a good thing if the SII sort of, as some guidance said, um, try and anchor your long-term presentation into whatever you think the relevant SDGs are for your company? Good idea or not? Oh, absolutely. I mean, yes. And, and why? Sure. Well, I think, I think Graham articulated it quite well. You know, in the sense that we have a... a he's got more money. Listen to him. <laughs> <laughs> we have a central framework. And he's older. We have a central framework. We all agree on it. I mean, the, the, con the conversation we're having constantly, particularly with the asset owners, is, and I won't throw any data, ESG data providers under the bus, but we'll have um, 5,000 listed equity scores, right? We'll look at ABC client, corporate client A. We'll look at data provider B. Same company, different score. So there's a qualitative over overlay because we haven't agreed on defining a consistent standard around materiality of X, be the E factor, the S factor, or the G factor. And it just, it's it's going to keep going back to that theme. So to your point, the using the S, utilizing the SGGs could potentially help accomplish that. I just I have to interject. I actually don't think that the average asset owner is as uh, familiar with the SDGs as, as the broad corporate community. That's what I've seen. Um, and again, this is endowments, foundations, family offices, where we advise their money. So the SDGs, they don't know so much, but I don't know that they need to know them. I think it's more important that the corporates know them. And I do think the framework is very important. I mean, think about it. Um, think about Michael Porter, Five Forces. That's a framework that's been around for decades, and it works. Framework is good. Sticking to a framework without any thought and an, uh, without any deep research, that's a problem. But I think that the SDGs provide a very helpful framework. And what's different this time from this and the Millennial Development Goals before is this time the corporates were involved in creating them. That is hugely important because when you have engagement, face it, uh, more people are aware of it. So yes, I think it's a great framework. I think you don't stick to it in such a way that it, it becomes noisy. And I think you know you pointed out some uh, geeky reports, or Mark did. I think the geeky reports are really interesting. I think materiality by sector matters. And we know that there's research from, obviously from George Serafin saying that if a company focuses on sustainability stuff, that actually doesn't matter to them on revenues, costs, or risk, then the company actually, it looks like it actually underperforms. It's a waste of time. So in that sense, I think the framework is very important. Multiple so you reasons. think materiality is interesting. I think it's interesting. A lot of people think it's boring. As Tim said, I like boring things. I met my wife on a blind date, okay, many years ago, and I spent the entire day talking about my first book on transfer pricing, okay? So that's kind of where I'm coming from. And remarkably enough, she still married me, and here we are today. So kind of there you go. Um, she picks we, out we his socks. Yeah, so so we, we yeah, she could explain she why. Exactly. I know. Bob, I do want to say that the other advantage of the SDGs is that it brings together the public sector, the private sector, and a coalition of governments. And that's, that's, that and that's number 17. And, and, and that's and right, the public private are partnerships. That's extremely critical. Right? I mean, I, I, I came to where you guys come with in. the expectation that I will form partnerships that will enable us to do more. Because we don't think at the World Bank or amongst multilateral agencies that we could ever hmm. solve the problems of the world. Together, we do about $100 billion a year, the multilateral development banks. And as Erica mentioned, I mean, the needs are just huge. I mean, if you take infrastructure for emerging market countries, it's $1.5 trillion. So even if all we did was infrastructure, we wouldn't be able to do that. So partnerships are extremely critical. So what are the things? They're going to do this thing again in, in September, as Daryl mentioned, I think. Um, what advice would you give to the CEOs that are going to be presenting? Well, the first one September. is what we both said. I mean, and everyone echoed. Uh, we need to move towards more common yeah. uh, standards. So the second standards, you know, frameworks. Because you know, SASB has got its own, yep. GRI has got its own. We've got the SDGs, and um, and 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 as you mentioned, the 169 targets <laughs> under. So having something that brings it all together, and maybe CCP can play that role in trying to help bring it all together, is one. The second, um, and in a bit uh, of a reaction to what Erica said, is that 
There's so much research out there as to the value of long-term, the value of ESG. I read only the ones that say that it makes business sense um, because most of them say that uh, today. So being clear about what is that value that you get from thinking long-term yeah. and from thinking ESG. There's so much that's been put together. And I mean, many years ago, some of the research was a bit half-half. Today, I think there's more research that basically shows that if you do, uh, if you focus on ESG, if you focus on long term, you will do better. Not even just in the long term, but also uh, um, uh, in the short term. The other thing that I would ask, since it's around the, um, uh, the uh, UN General Assembly, because uh, it's September, is um, maybe I can have a show of hands of those who are signed up to the PRI, whose organizations are signed up to the PRI. I, I, I think it's, it's a fair number. Uh, it's, I think for those of us who are signed up to the PRI, basically to think about encouraging others through what we think of being signed up to the PRI to join and be a signatory uh, to the PRI. Because the momentum that's created around the UNGA uh, uh, and what's happened with the Global Compact and others, I think is a useful um, a point of reference in terms of advocacy as well. Other ideas, recommendations for the CEOs presenting in September? I, I, the two elements that strike me here is this, there's this issue of you know, the irrationality of human behavior. And so we talk about long-termism, and I think we also have to recognize that there are people here, and CEOs are people, and they're having these conversations. And, and as much as we can sort of propose this long-term, how much it goes back to the incentives. Um, so what I'm trying to say is the, the, the financial incentives for a lot of these uh, particularly the senior leadership, but others, that really, we, I think we need a deeper dive in, around that. And I think there's some efforts underway. Uh, but the compensation aspect is really critical because you can put all the frameworks in place, but unless the individuals that make the decisions, their compensation and the incentives that align for them match those frameworks, then it's, you know, it seems to be a cognitive dissonance there. Um, you know, I, I do think there's also the roles that everybody should be playing. I, I, I guess to Arunma's point, I think we're, we're, we're dealing with a transition in the, sort of the, the global system where institutions that, you know, the Bretton Woods Agreement is, is a perfect example where a lot of institutions, UN, World Bank, IMF, played a certain role in a different era. And I think the companies inherently are at the cutting edge and pushing through and creating the boundaries. And I don't know that the public institutions match the requirements of companies to be able to do the best that they can do. So I think a lot about sort of sharing financial risk. Um, a, a number of uh, investors, multilaterals and the like can do a better job of helping these companies operate in this way by put it, putting the capital in and structuring it in a way that really allows these companies to take more risk where they can. So just a number of more specific ideas, Bob, to put on, the, put on paper as opposed to sort of the intergalactic stuff, which I'm also really good at. Did you think these, these plans in general were long term or not? I mean, I didn't know if I was going to come in and see like 10-year financial projections or whatever. I mean, the asset owners will say they have five to seven years. It's a big issue around time frames. Um, you know, most of the presentations that I saw were um, in terms of trying to not even just project out, but I didn't always feel where the long-termism was coming in in terms of time. Am I, I just missing something? Yeah, I felt the long-termism was there in terms of business model. The long-termism as, as it relates to culture may not have been there as much as we would like to see. And there's one thing, when you think about the markets, global markets and the economy, you know, we've had a problem where you know, the economic multiplier effect has stopped. Right, we were stalled for a while, and even today, the U.S. markets are probably um, discounting all good and nothing bad. So the bottom line is we've got to get the economy moving, and that means the private sector, right, corporate economic multiplier effect. And so there's an there's an issue of risk that you mentioned that that stops economics from working because people kind of freeze up, and so. Aside from the fact that um, one thing I'd like to see from the CEOs is explicit examples, um, because we do need to understand the culture of the firm. So explicit anecdotes, because that actually helps restore trust in the institutions, in the systems. And there's one uh, equation that, that I like to use. It's called the, uh, the trust quotient. And the trust quotient is the, um, the product of, um, of credibility, and intimacy 
divided by risk. And so CEOs need to be enormously credible. They need to show anecdotes and show the humanity, intimacy, and then they need to show us how they're going to bring risk down as best they can. And that'll help with trust. So I think those are the kind of things maybe we should see more of uh, in September. Not to be confused with the trust barometer, because <laughs> we know that that exists here. I, I do want to say that uh, maybe something else is basically to showcase examples of how um, companies are thinking long term. Uh, and the prism that I was listening with uh, to the presentations was that. So for example, I think it was uh, the city CEO who talked about what they're doing in financial inclusion and how something that they started off as being a service that would be free uh, to people who probably didn't have the means has become one of their fastest growing opportunities and that everybody and the uptake is everyone. Um, and, and so helping skeptics start to think about, oh, is this, maybe this is something that actually makes business sense, I think is also uh, extremely important. He had mentioned uh, that we need to play a better role, uh, multilateral agencies, in providing support. Philanthropy too. Um, no, no, but I, but I, uh, I, I want to say the, the area that I'm, that I'm uh, familiar with. We agree with you uh, completely. In fact, uh, Jim Kim, our president, has been very clear about the issue of mobilizing uh, the private sector. He's also been clear as to how we see what our business is. So you will hear from us something about cascading uh, in the coming um, uh, uh, very shortly. Uh, and basically, we're saying if the private sector can do it, we shouldn't. If the private sector can't do it, we should try and see what it is we can do to de-risk the environment for the private sector. Uh, and if the environment is so risky that it can't be done, then we should be there, uh, you know, carrying the first loss or whatever. The um, our, our donor uh, countries recently replenished the um, our soft arm window, uh, the International Development Association, to the tune of seventy-five billion dollars. $2.5 billion of that has been given to IFC, our private sector arm, that's the breach of the private, uh, between the public sector and private sector, basically to work in fragile states uh, in the private sector, $2.5 billion assigned. That same replenishment has asked us, after 56 years of IDA being uh, in existence, to leverage the capital markets to be able to do more. So the donors put in $25 billion. They've asked us to raise another $25 billion uh, from the capital markets and bring $25 billion for internally generated resources. So the donors, because they also understand that there are challenges in their own countries uh, with uh, funding uh, agencies, with uh, budget constraints, they're asking us to think very creatively about how we do this. And, and I know time's against us, but many of you may be familiar with the Pandemic Emergencies Facility, which was set up last year. For those who are not familiar with it, Ebola happened in 2014. And Jim Kim said, because the world didn't move as quickly as it should move, um, we had three countries where we had development gains being, being unwound. But we had the threat of Ebola affecting the whole world. So let's put in place a standby facility working with insurance companies, working with the capital markets to be able to see how we can do that. So we're looking also at innovative solutions. We're working with the capital markets. We're working with insurance companies to see how we can, uh, 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 we can do more. So I do think that thinking about how we can work together and innovatively address, I consider the risks as opportunities. Uh, and I think that those who are thinking long term are certainly focused on the opportunities and not the risks. Mark, and then I'm going to open it up for some Q&A. Just a quick Advice. elaboration of Graham's point around long-termism and incentive comp. I'd take that one step further and looking at individual corporations' own portfolios and using these ESG factors to identify uh, sustainability risk profile, particularly e, the E piece, the sustainability of uh, their resources, right? So are they getting really granular around the, the actual risks of their own portfolios and their companies? I think that'd be an interesting topic to bring up as well. How are you? not only from an incentive comp perspective on a long-term basis, but on a long-term basis, we're actually looking at our own portfolios, our own holdings, and identifying some of these tail risks potentially embedded in our portfolios. Great, so the clock is ticking. I want to give my panelists a chance to make some closing reflections, but let me take a couple of questions now. Yeah. 
I really appreciate the tough graders here, you know, sending the bar higher and higher and higher. That's what we really need. Give we don't have time. Yeah, we don't have time. So we need to make progress. So questions? Uh, Clara? Um, I just I just wanted to ask uh, to add one kind of thing for September, which was I didn't hear a whole lot. I may have been in the wrong <laughs> in, in in the wrong sessions, but I didn't hear a lot about the countervailing forces that are working against long termism in in real time in these companies. There was lots of love for long termism, <laughs> and that's wonderful, but. I think there there are challenges that if we put them out there and if investors understand them, especially large scale investors, there might be room for a different kind of collaboration than we now have. So just a comment. One more maybe? One more question? There. <coughs> Richard Howitt from the International Integrated Reporting Council, and good to see Erica and Bob, two of our ambassadors on the, on the panel. Just on Mark's uh, challenge to us about not having too many different frameworks, I think we should acknowledge the existence of the corporate reporting dialogue. IRC has brought together FASB, GRI, and then the major financials as well, ISB, um, uh, SASB as well, I should have said. Uh, with the precise aim of trying to get them aligned uh, and to try to bring some sort of order to this, exactly what you said, Mark. And I think if more people knew about that, it would increase the confidence there is in the frameworks that are there. Yeah. And in particular, the earlier part of your debate about the sustainable development goals, what each of these frameworks have done is to do a piece of work this year, 2017, on how the Sustainable Development Goals, the SDGs, are a common foundation for them all. Uh, and I think if there was more awareness of that, then that would inspire more confidence from some of the companies, including the ones in this room. But I would want to just finally say that we very much prize the relationship with CECP, and I think today's event has been fantastic. Great, so we're kind of getting towards the end. We've given advice to the CEOs, we've given advice to the Strategic Investor Initiative, we all own it too. Like real quick, each one of you, like what's your commitment? What are you gonna do going forward? How can you help push the ball down the field? Well, I'm gonna keep trying to convince everyone that whatever you wanna call it, sustainable investing and values-based investing and double bottom line, triple bottom line, impact investing, ESG analytics, it's investing. It's just investing. And so we'll know that we've made progress in terms of the language we use and in terms of the you know imperatives we're facing. When people realize using ESG and sustainability discussions, I mean, frankly, is just better research. It's better investment process. Great. Graham, what about you? Uh, just really quickly build on Erica's point. I think the, the, the mega trend here, which was alluded to probably earlier this morning, is this element of sort of automation and really, let's call it sort of the, 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 the emergence of data and the tools that allow us to analyze this data is, is really a, an incredible opportunity to align to the points that, that, that Erica framed out. And the, the more that we can get these companies to work and in the investors, managers, and the, and, and the owners to start to recognize that understanding the data that effectively price social and environment, environmental risk will actually reduce uh, risk and create future opportunity for us, but to do so in a reasonably coordinated fashion is in our collective best interest. And I think groups like CCP and others can help to drive that change. I'll use my time to just say a big thank you to CCP for uh, uh, inviting us to be part of this and uh, to say that I'm here with Marcelo and uh, Saflatna, my colleagues from the bank. Um, and you know, we will be here at the reception. Uh, because at the bank group, and there are five institutions, and most people don't realize that. I think the common thing is that we're there to do rescue investments around the world. We have convening power, uh, and we have the credibility of execution that some of the multilateral agencies uh, may not have. Because as a AAA rated institution, we have to walk our talk. Uh, and I hope that everybody leaving here uh, we'll think about walking the talk and not just talking the talk. Thank you. Great. Mark, you get the last word. Sure. So I would say let's keep it simple. Uh, I'd like to use the historical timeline. 1887, we established the ICPA. 1934, we established the SEC. 1973, we established FASB, Financial Factors. 
What did we do in, in 2011? We established SASB, non-financial factors. All ESG is our scores. These are non-financial factors to get more transparent. This is the evolution of transparency. I definitely want to give a shout out to the CECP and this SII board. I'm thrilled to be here, thrilled to work with all of you. And uh, I think I attended one of these about a decade ago, and there was probably five people at the table. So it's really encouraging to see all the great faces. So thank you. Thanks to the panel. Thanks to the audience. Thank you very much. <laughs>